Hi there, in this lecture we're going to be looking at how useful observations are in sociological research. Um, so when examining any research method you need to be able to comment on its usefulness for research based on how practical it is, how ethical, how reliable, how representative and how valid it is. And I will talk to you a bit about mix methods as well because that's actually one of the solutions to sociological research being perhaps unethical. You might then choose an alternative method that is highly ethical to kind of make up for that weakness. So um, let's have a look at the different variations of observations. Um, so observations, there is um, covert, overt, participant, non-participant and structured. So I will talk to you about those variations just here. Um, so let's talk about overt. Um, so overt um, observation is when the participants know they're being observed. OK, so they're aware they're being studied. Uh, and one of the big issues with overt is um, people will change their behavior when they know they're being watched. So you can have overt participant observation um, and covert participant observation. Um, so I've given the example there of, um, if you see the Bruce Parry um, Amazon tribe, as an example of overt participant observation. Um, you can tell he's taken part in the research there because he's painted himself in some of the sort of the tribal, if you like, makeup or markings. Um, he's dressing like the tribe members. Uh, however, it's, it's clear he's not able to go undercover and be covert because his physical characteristics, he's white. Um, he's not from the ethnic background of the rest of the tribe. So they're all going to be well aware that he's studying them. But he really immersed himself in their way of life to kind of gain some understanding of what it was like living as an Amazon tribe. Um, so that's your participant over. Um, Non-participant over will be when you don't take part with the group. So you might look at what they're doing. So a good example might be um, someone sitting in the back of a classroom um, uh, and observing what happens in the room. Everyone's aware they're there but they're not actually taking part in the research. Um, you've also got um, covert um, participant and covert non-participant. So some of you might be aware, aware of a famous study called A Glasgow Gang Observed by James Patrick. Um, uh, James Patrick went, it's a, changed his name by the way, that's not his real name. He went undercover. Um, he dressed in a particular way. He um, gained access to, if you like, a criminal gang in Glasgow uh, through through a gatekeeper, someone he sort of knew, who uh, gave him access to this group. Um, and he spent a bit of time with this criminal gang, um, trying to gain some insight into um, their operations, what they did, you know, wh why they were members. Uh, very dangerous study. He ended up having to leave the group uh, very quickly and moving away and having to change his identity. So, you know, it was obviously quite a risky um, study as well. Um, but that's covert participant observation. And no one else in the gang knew that he was a researcher, um, but he was able to gain some quite useful information about that group that you couldn't really have used any other method to gain that access because, you know, they're not going to fill out a questionnaire on, you know, why they commit crime. Um, and then you've also got covert non-participant. Um, this can be um, you watching people um, without them realising. Um, you can uh, watching people using cameras and looking at their behaviour. Um, and hopefully lots of you have sort of thought, hang on, that is, doesn't sound that ethical. You know, whether it's covert participant or covert non-participant, the fact that it's covert is really unethical. Um, the last type of observation I wanted to mention to you is what's known as a structured observation, sometimes called a systematic observation. So this might be when you observe a group and you count certain behaviours. Uh, it can be overt or covert. Um, so I've given you an example there. Say I was sat in the back of the classroom and I was like, oh, gosh, you know, I wonder what the difference in behaviour between boys and girls, uh, which one's more pro-school, which one's more anti-school between the genders. I might count how often I see these behaviours from boys and girls. And I've given you a list there and I've made a little tally chart, for example. Um, and then I might look at this data and then say, you know what? I can see more pro-school behaviour from girls or an anti-school from boys, and I can conclude that boys are more anti-school. OK, but, but actually that's not necessarily what the data is saying. OK, that's just um, me analysing it very briefly. So that's what's known as a structured observation. Um, and that's a way of collecting quantitative data from observation. The other methods I've spoken to you about will collect qualitative data. OK, however, a tally chart is clearly numbers, it's quantities, it's quali quantitative data. So let's have a think about how useful observations are. And again, these lists are getting longer if you've looked at my other lectures, because obviously there's so many different types of observations. So in terms of practicality, observations are not generally considered practical. OK, so 
just to be aware. The only ones that are practical are what's known as the structured observation that I briefly spoke to you about. Okay, because they're not very time consuming. Um, they don't cost a lot of money to run. Um, but for the most part, observations are not considered very practical in terms of time and cost. <clears throat> And it is worth mentioning practically, um, overt and non-participant types of observation are considered safer as well for the researcher, which is a practical matter. Uh, in terms of ethical issues, um, their observations are, can be good if they're overt, because that means you get informed consent. There's no deception. You're not lying to anyone and you can easily debrief the participants afterwards. Um, and it is worth mentioning that if you do a non-participant type of observation, then you don't form any sort of attachments or trusting relationships with the groups that you're studying. So when you leave or you finish the study, they're not going to be harmed by you leaving. They're not going to be upset or sad that you've left because they formed a friendship with you. So that's ethical. Uh, in terms of reliability, only structured observations are reliable because you're using exactly the same criteria for examining that group and other groups that you might do. Um, but other types of observations are very much unreliable because you cannot replicate the same behaviours, you cannot replicate the same ways of measuring and the same conversations in other observations. Um, validity. Um, so this is where observation, particularly covert, comes into its strengths. Um, covert observation, you will not get any Hawthorne effect. So Hawthorne effect only applies to observations. If you're being, if you are being observed, okay and you know you're being observed then you will change your behavior okay that's what's known as the all hawthorne effect however if you do a covert observation where no one knows they're being studied um then you won't get any hawthorne effect you'll get true behavior um even in overt observations however over time participants may forget they're being studied which can increase the validity so even when you know someone's there watching you if they're there every day um, you might just forget they're there. You might just kind of start acting normally after maybe a couple of days or a couple of weeks. Um, and one of the big strengths of participant observation, whether it's over or covert, is because the research is doing what the participants are doing. So like Bruce Parry in the Amazonian tribes, because he was doing what they did, he was eating what they ate, sleeping how they slept. He really gained a real insight into what it was like to live as that group. And that really increases validity, a real understanding of that group. Now, not useful. So there's plenty of practical issues. So observations are generally considered not very practical because they um, take a lot of time to do to observe groups and uh, they can cost quite a bit. So um, access, um, particularly if it's covert, but also overt, if you want to gain access to a group um, they might not want to be studied so you're going to, have to spend a lot of time gaining the trust of the group to gain access and you might actually need a gatekeeper's permission <clears throat> so that could be a gang leader if it's a criminal group or a member of the gang you might have to gain access to that person you might have to lie to them quite a lot and then they have to kind of bring you along to the group so that's getting a gatekeeper to gain access um, and likewise even if you're doing some re over research it might take a long time for that group to kind of allow you to see them in their natural behavior. So access can be an issue. Um, like I mentioned, it's time consuming for most observations, much more time consuming than other methods. It can be really costly to run an observation, uh, particularly if you're like James Patrick, had to adopt a new identity, buy new clothes, live in a different address. But also, even if you're doing um, a uh, covert observation uh, sorry covert non-participant if you've got to pay for camera recording equipment that's going to cost money um, your physical characteristics how you look is going to restrict your options when it comes to observation um, whether it's overt but mainly covert uh, so I can't go and do covert observation of um, oh, I don't know I couldn't do covert observation of Amazonian tribes because I'm white um, so I wouldn't be able to do that type of observation they know that I was there and they changed their behavior um, likewise, I might not be able to find out a lot about why um, boys choose to play football um, more than rugby, for example, because they might not open up to me because I'm female. Okay, my, my gender is going to restrict how honest they are. Um, there's also safety issues to consider in covert re research. Okay, so that's a bit of a practical issue. Safety for the participant, uh, for the researcher, sorry. Um, ethical issues. So covert. All of you will be aware, covert observation, participant or non, 
is really unethical because you're not getting informed consent from the participants. Okay, you're not asking their permission to use the, their um, their details. You're not asking permission to use the information that you collect. There's no debrief. There's no right to withdraw. They can't refuse to take part. And this can cause quite a lot of harm if once they find out they've been studied. Okay, particularly if you formed a close relationship with anyone in the group. When you then turn around and then leave and then perhaps publish your findings that can really harm someone because they've trusted someone it turns out that they're not who they said they were and that can be quite harmful <clears throat> um representative issues um uh, generally on small groups observations even if it's structured um you can't conduct it on huge numbers but yeah covert observation particularly and over observation will be on small groups and it has to be on small groups because you want to spend a lot of time building up a really rich and detailed picture of what's going on in these small groups. And that's really time consuming. You can't do that in large numbers. So observation is generally considered unrepresentative and difficult to generalise to the whole population. But some groups you can only study using this method, criminal groups, deviant groups. Um, and you will gain quite a lot of rich insight into that way of life, which incre increases the validity. So sometimes you have to sacrifice the ethical and the representative issues to kind of get the high levels of validity. Um, and there are reliability issues because the researcher really doesn't control the flow of the research in most types of observations. So they can't replicate the exact observation a year later with a different group, for example. Um, and then finally, validity issues. If it's over, you're going to get the all Hawthorne effect. People will change their behaviour if they know they're being watched. So that means that you're no longer seeing the truth. Um, and even if it's covert, just the presence of a new person in a group, you might not know they're a researcher, but you will still perhaps modify your behaviour because there's someone new there. You might want to show off to them so you'll act up. Or you might not want to reveal um, some of the more shady parts of your behaviour because you've got a new person there. Just want to talk to you briefly again about mixed methods. Um, but so methods that are high in reliability and representativeness are often low in validity. Um, so you need to kind of pick a method that makes up for the weakness of the other method that you might be using in your research. Or you could even use three methods. So if I choose to use official statistics, what other method could I use to make up for the weaknesses of official statistics? OK, so let's have a think about what the main weakness of official statistics is and what method would make up for that weakness. Have a go at that activity. If you can't do it, listen to the lecture on secondary data and then have a go at it. Thanks for listening.